Well, welcome everyone to Dive Deep Live. It is great to have you here tonight. Dive Deep Live is a ministry of Christ Wesleyan Church where we seek to go deeper and become better disciples of Jesus Christ. I'm your host, Kyle Roberts, the pastor of spiritual formation here at Christ Wesleyan Church. And our series, The Power of 40, discusses the importance of the number 40 in scripture and how we can engage in 40 days of prayer and fasting as a church. This is the last weekend not weekend, week of the power of 40. That's kind of sad. I really enjoyed this one, learning about all of the different occurrences of 40 in scripture, some of which I knew, but a lot of which I did not know. So it's pretty cool to learn more about that. But anyways, we're excited for you to hear Pastor Brandon's thoughts from his sermon this past weekend. Pastor Brandon, thank you once again for being here. You're welcome. So the question that I have for you today, normally we ask some sort of fun question to get to know your pastor a little bit more, but this one is more on a serious note to really get to know you a little bit more. So the question is, would you want to know the date of your death? How would that information change things for you? Yeah, it's interesting you asked that because in a sermon a couple weeks ago, I said that I like to know the ending of the books or the series and I thought tomatoes were going to be thrown at me from the congregation with how y'all reacted. But I would answer differently here because I wouldn't want to know the date. Because, I mean, we, we all have an expiration date, so we know that it's out there. We know every day we're getting closer, you know, to our death day. But if you were to know the day, of course it would change. Like, if I knew... January 22nd of 2032, like that, that was the day that I would be That's gone. That's not that far. Like right now, you're looking at 11, Brinkley would be like 13 yeah. years old, losing her dad. And so like you would just look to that date, maybe it would change the way you'd live because, but really when Jesus says, you know, we're not promised tomorrow even, Focus on today because today in itself has enough trouble of its own. I'll worry about that. So in my mind, I just I wouldn't want to know. Because then if you would if you were to know, just think if you wake up on that day and you know, well, today's it, you would look at every opportunity to say, Well, that's not gonna get me, that's not gonna get me, that's not going to, and you would just live in a bubble that whole day. You know, but then, you know, something happens internally. You have a heart attack or something like that. But I don't think I would want to know. I wouldn't want to know either, mainly because I feel like I would live every day dreading that day that would come because that's just my personality. I mean, if I know something's coming, I'm thinking about that thing like almost all the time. So if it's my death, yeah, I'm going to be thinking about it a lot. So it would just that would be the thing on my mind all the time. And I've had to learn to like experience the journey, not just the destination. So not that death is a destination that we really hope to get to, but I mean, as Christians, that's the next step in our faith journey. That is the next step of eventually when Christ comes back and you were talking about his second coming this past weekend, the, hence why I chose this question in the first place. So it's just, it's really interesting to think about who in this room would disagree with us? Would you want to know the date of your death? Yeah, who would want to know? Anybody in here? By a show of hands? Nobody. Okay, so nobody right. would want to know. I think it would probably be a general consensus. I think so, too. Across the board. I don't know, it would just be depressing. It's like one you of those, know that day, but you know the day's coming, but you definitely wouldn't want to know when. I mean, Jesus says, don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat, where, mm -hmm. you know, because he, he holds that. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I'd like to talk with somebody who would. I wonder who maybe on staff or here in the congregation might say, yeah, I want to know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Tim McGraw talks about live like you were dying. So he would say, live like every day is your last. So that's a good point. He said, live like you die tomorrow. Mm hmm because that would affect today, but Tim McGraw or Jesus. But hopefully we don't die tomorrow, because that's, that's the plan, at least. Right, exactly. <laughs> All right, well, let's go ahead and get into the sermon recap. Would you go ahead and just 
give us a short synopsis of your sermon from this past weekend? So we talked about the ascension, which was 40 days after the resurrection, where Jesus appeared to his disciples and many other witnesses. Over 500 people witnessed his resurrected body. And so we just discussed why the ascension and what Jesus did with the disciples to assure them of who he is and now who they are. And I was just, I found it really cool. Jesus began his earthly ministry. Well, before he began it, he spent 40 days in the wilderness in preparation. And really these 40 days, he was returning and having people see him resurrected to help prepare them in continuing his earthly ministry, but then him prepping for his eternal ministry as well, which is interceding on our behalf. Mm -hmm. So we broke that down a little bit and talked about how the disciples reacted to it. They worshiped, they waited until the spirit came. And then, you know, asked some questions, how, how we need to worship as a result, where our focus needs to be. So let's go ahead and get into the Bible passage specifically. And this week, given that there were two passages, I wanted to go a little bit more into the Luke 24 passage. So if you have your Bibles with you, either if it's a physical one or if it's on your phone, let's go ahead and go to Luke chapter 24, verses 26 through 53. These are talking about how Jesus actually appeared to the disciples and his ascension at the end of Luke. And it really leads into what you were talking about in Acts as well, because Luke basically picks up right from there. Luke both wrote both Luke and Acts. So it's really just a, uh, oh, is it 36? Yes, it is 36. Thanks for doing that. So Luke chapter 34 verses 36 through 53, not 26. That's my bad. Chapter 24, not chapter 24. Yeah. Yes. Let's see how much a lot of numbers. Confuse people. Here we go. <laughs> Maybe it's uh, because I was taking everybody's dinner money today. I'm just numbered out all this. All right, let's go ahead and read this scripture passage. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And see, I am sending upon you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. There they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. They were continually in the temple, blessing God. So the first question that I want to ask you specifically from this passage is, why is it important that Jesus came back as a physical person? What does this mean for when us as Christians are later resurrected as well? Well, first, I think he appeared the way he did to bring validity that it was really him, that he wasn't a ghost. And so in order for them to believe this message, to then go all the way to the ends of the earth to proclaim his name, they were going to have to believe it. And so over 500 people saw this physical body. That's why he ate. Because mm -hmm. as a ghost, you don't eat. But this, he chewed it. It stayed in his stomach, meaning that there was a physical resurrection there. So one, he needed to be noticeable 
to them that it was actually him. It wasn't just some spirit. It was actually the physical Christ mm-hmm. risen. And now in his eternal state, there is that, that physical form. And what, what it means for us today is that we can pass from this earthly life to the next and have that same spirit. Obviously, there's a, there's a new body, mm-hmm. but it's to show that, you know, I think it's to show that it's not just, an e- just eternal. You can cross from this life to the next when we're all going to be resurrected. He just wanted to show that, no, it's possible. There, there's going to be a physicalness about it, that you're going to leave this earth, you're going to come back mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, I think there's a sense in which, um, especially with passages that talk about sin being in the flesh, the flesh in and of itself is not your physicality that it's talking about in the midst of those contexts. The flesh is rather the the interpretation of sin at that point. The flesh was something that was seen as bad, and in the midst of Romans, when Paul was addressing this specific crowd— They saw the flesh as something to completely get rid of, something that you must separate your spirit from your physical being, and only then will you actually achieve enlightenment, the docetists, I believe that they were called. But here we can see that physicality in and of itself is not a bad thing. God created the world to be physical, and there's a sense in which the physical and the spiritual were together in the Garden of Eden, that the presence of God could be in the presence of man, and there was not anything that was bad about that physicality. It was only when sin was introduced that that separation came into play. So I think it's really important that... I was going to bring that, the garden up. Yeah, yep. So, and I think to bring that to the other side of the equation, some people believe that when we die, it will merely be a spiritual state for the rest of eternity. But here we see that Jesus is clearly in a physical state. So there will be some sort of physical state that we will also be in in the rest of eternity as well. That's interesting to think about. Like, what will that physical and eternity look like? It's not just like? going to be a heaven state. It's, it's a new heaven and a new earth. Yes. But heaven and earth will be able to exist together again because there would be no sin mm-hmm. blocking that. That same bond that we had once in the Garden of Eden and that was torn away from sin will once again be repaired by God himself. And that spiritual and physical side of things will once again be enmeshed with one another. And it's just, it's really interesting to think about. And that's, I think that's a really important part in this passage. So you also brought up in your sermon four characteristics of a Christ follower. A Christ follower is one who worships, is one who has joy, is one who serves, and is one who is focused on the mission. Which one are you best at, and which one do you need work on? Well, I think, I think they're all necessary. One who worships, one who has joy, one who serves. I think for me it's focus. It's focusing on the mission because there are so many distractions that can take us away from the mission like when i look at worshiping you know worshiping together as the body make sure i have my disciplines in order of every day i'm dying to myself which in itself is hard because focus actually takes away from worship too Mm -hmm. focus also takes us away from joy and focus when we're focused on ourselves it also takes us away from service as well so that's why i ended with focus Mm -hmm. Because if you're focused in the right way, you're going to have the worship placed in the right direction. If you're worshiping correctly and you're dying to self, you're automatically going to have joy and you're automatically going to serve. Like miserable Christian, it it just can't exist. Mm -hmm. So when there's a miserable Christian, which I don't think can exist, but when they say they're Christians and they're miserable, there's, there's a focus thing there. And it's mostly they're focused on themselves and they probably worship materialistic things. And then they're prob- those people probably don't serve correctly either. Mm-hmm. But joy and service actually come out of how we worship and our true acts of worship. It's just a natural characteristic. But worship and focus actually goes together. I didn't bring that up in my sermon. I kind of wanted to, mm-hmm. 
But if you're focused on the right things, that means you're worshiping in the right way and the right things. And then joy and service are just a result of it. Yeah, I think they naturally flow out of that focus on the mission. I know personally for myself, if there's some things that I need to work on, I can't do them all at the same time. I live in usually boxes. So if there's this one box that I'm working in, I'm focused on that one thing. If there's like, I'll shift over um, in the, what was it? Phil Gunger, when he came and was talking about men and women um, with guys like, Generally, we tend to focus on one thing and then it's like, all right, we'll naturally make that shift over. I'm very much like that where like I'll be focused on one thing. And if if there's something else that distracts me from that one thing, I completely swap out and such. So my thought on this question is how do we like we're always focused on the mission, but there is a sense in which. For me. Focusing in on one thing helps that to become habit and helps me to like naturally ingrain worship and joy and service into myself. So what are some other things that like we can hone in on in a season to become a part of ourselves and then like move on to the next thing, but still keep that within us? Does that make sense? In essence? Kind of. Okay. <laughs> kind of. Are you asking me a question? I don't know, actually. So, because <laughs> I think you ask, what are some things in seasons? Like, for me, right now, Brinkley being two years old, I mean, she's, it takes a little bit more of my focus and attention because she's not as independent as she's going to be. And so, like, there's a little bit more attention, you know, there. Like, sometimes, for whatever reason, she makes me late to work. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I, li I like to be on time if not early, but like this morning, she had a huge fit and Nikki didn't get a lot of sleep. So I said, okay, I can be 15 ish minutes late by making her a bottle and getting her settled down for Nikki. So she doesn't have to get up as much. So I like to kind of come in and, you know, get my focus right in work before work. Okay. And so I didn't get to do that this morning. So kind of threw me off a little bit, but when Brinkley's not completely in that stage, you know, maybe at that other box we can live in. Isn't it nice to be men and have a nothing box? It just, women, I guess you can't have a nothing box and it drives you nuts. I just, <laughs> I just so love that. Do you have a nothing box? Oh, totally. Like I have I'll just to be sitting there on the couch I know. and Chloe's like, what are you thinking about? Nothing. Yeah. And then she like, thinks I'm thinking about something, but just don't want to tell her about it. Yeah, girls are like, like no, I'm possible. just, I'm yeah. like a vegetable right now. Is, I honestly am thinking about nothing. Yeah, <laughs> no, nothing is going on right now in my mind. Yeah. That's, thinking, well, that's why we can play video games for hours and hours of the nonsense. It's a nothing box. Things. Yeah, that's yep. our nothing box. Yeah. And anyway, sorry, that, that's a <laughs> tangent, but I don't know. And then once she asked me that question, I'm like, wait, what does she think I'm thinking about now? And then I just get into a cyclical box of some, anyways. I oh, overthink cyclical. it. Good word. Cyclical, yeah. So, we got to our questions pretty early today, yeah. I think. I mean, it's 7.05, but... Uh, that means how? we get to your questions. Or yes. do you have another one? Well, I don't have any more questions, at least at this point. Okay. So, uh, let's just open it up to the floor. If you guys have any questions, go ahead and raise your hand where you are. I will come to you with the microphone, so that way people on the podcast can also hear what kind of questions you've got. It can be either about the sermon, about the Bible passage, um, about the nothing box. It can really about it can be about whatever you want to learn more about at this time. And how many times can I say about in one sentence as well? Just thinking I think you about did that. five. Just five. Then. But your sentence was a run on too. So <laughs> I apologize. Grammar is not my Any questions? Tonight. Any questions? I will come to you and I will be quiet. <laughs> Curtis. Yeah, welcome back. All right. So I really appreciated the end of your sermon where you were saying where some are called to go and some are called to stay. Um, we were in a group and one of the members had brought up. Um, that people were too focused on golf. And as a golfer, I took exception to that because I feel... Yeah, I golf too. Just let me know when you want to... Absolutely. But um, so I took offense to that because I feel like we are made and placed for a purpose 
as a golfer, I have the opportunity to talk to these people about Christ where they might not get it from someone else. So I'm just curious as to where you think that passion, where that, you know, hobby that it might have, whether it's golf or artwork or whatever it may be, could cross the line, so to speak, um, you know, where you're investing maybe too much time or it's distracting you from God or, you know, where, where that might become a problem. I think it can actually become a problem. And so the problem isn't because it's all going. It's just how far you're called to go. So maybe stay was a poor choice of words, but some of us are going to go into our community, go to the next house or go, you know, golfing with somebody, you know, but then there's also go further, go to the mission field, go to this city, go to this state. But the most important thing is, is one, we are all open to where that is. And so a lot of times with golf, and I can see the point where we can get too comfortable in, in that state or where we're at or in that maybe if you want to call it that comfortability or recreation, that when God asks us to go, that very thing actually causes us to stay or miss the mission moment. But it could also open you up where you can actually use golf to talk to people about Jesus because people need Jesus here in our backyard just as much as they do overseas. But they're not gonna, God's not going to call everybody overseas because then who's going to talk to a golf owner if all the Christians are elsewhere? And so what I wanted to get at there was we are all called to different purposes. So in this text that we see, Jesus is specifically talking to the disciples at that moment. We have to keep things in context. And then when we see the context, then we can extract it to say, what does that mean for us? So when Jesus said to the ends of the earth, the disciples actually didn't go to the ends of the earth because they didn't come over here to America, but their message did. And so a few of the disciples and the apostles were called to go. We know the apostle Paul, we know Peter, we know they went further than a lot of people, but what they did, they were called to be missionaries. Jesus called them to be missionaries. And so they would go and Paul would establish a church He would establish a leader and a Christian community that then they would stay in their community and bring people to Jesus through their community. But Paul wasn't with them most of the time. All he did was get them established as a church, and then that church became that community where then Jesus was adding to their number daily. Why? And so if you go to Acts 2.42, it's very clear why God added to their number daily. It's because they had everything in common where Christians were acting like Christians with each other. They were selling property. They were doing things that were crazy because another one of my Christian brothers is in debt and is in trouble, so I'm going to sell my extra car. Well, they didn't have cars back then, but just to put it in perspective, I'm going to sell my extra car because they're going to lose their house and they have two kids. And so what happened was that community saw Christians being that way and said, whoa, And then God added to their number daily those who are being saved because they actually looked inside the church and saw what a church community is supposed to do. But a lot of times, Paul wasn't there. Peter wasn't there to witness these things, but their established culture there. But if all the Christians were like, okay, okay, let's go, moving on, then who's there to witness and be a witness to those being added to their number daily? And so just because... Paul and Peter were called to be missionaries and go out and establish churches, which was great, which is essentially what Jesus wanted them to do. There was also those powerhouse people in the book of Acts that also stayed where they were at to be a light in the community. And so you just have to discern, what does God want for me? And just because God wants this for me, but that other person isn't where I am, it doesn't make one right or one wrong. You just need to be at a point where you're, where you're obedient. If you can go golfing four times a week and be obedient to the call God has for you to maybe branch out and team up with a couple of people you know aren't believers and say, hey, next week you want to go a golf scramble with us and whatever, and then you were to invite me to that golf scramble and we could 
you know, help each other out, you know, while we're beating other people, we can also win them to Jesus. Or, or that, that owner of that place, there's a reason God gave you the skills and the passion to golf. But how can we use those? And the moment we're not using those skills or where we're at to obey Jesus and getting people to know him, that's when we be, can become complacent. That's when we can become very comfortable. And I think sometimes in those moments, God might call you further to get you a little bit out of your comfort zone when you're so established in your comfort zone. Does that make sense? A little bit more. So I see the validity in what he was saying, but you can't just make a general a blanket statement like that. Because that might be his call. He needs, he's going to own up to Jesus one day according to his call. Yeah. But when we put things in context, Jesus was saying this to a movement that had not happened yet. Nobody knew about Jesus outside of that, that central focus of the world at that point in the Middle East. They didn't know about Jesus in Rome until after Jesus died, you know, and then the spirit came and they were all boosted out out of their areas. That needed to happen or the ends of the earth would have never happened. And so that, that's what I'm getting at, too, is let's, let's keep it in context a little bit. And what Jesus had to do with them, that's the reason you and I know who Jesus is, because they listened to that. And so we just have to take it into our culture and just say, we're called. There are plenty of people around us. We don't have to go very far to help the homeless and to save the ungodly. You can, and some do, but that's, that's their call. Our call might be to be here. It's just obedience to reiterate and to repeat. Yeah, two things that I want to touch on that I had thought about too. The first is Augustine talks about sin as being a misplaced love. In regards to like the things that we love to do, and interacting with others in our mission field, do we love the action more than we love the people that are being ministered to? So, for example, the one thing that I like to do is I love to sing barbershop music. Um, I love to get together with the guys every Tuesday and sing barbershop music. But if I were to start to love the music more than the people that are there, who are Christians and non-Christians, that's when it becomes a problem. That's when I'm no longer loving others and instead just loving what I like to do best. And I think that there's a big difference there when we put it that way. And it's not to say that it's wrong to like what you do. I mean, I like to barbershop sing, therefore I barbershop sing with other guys. That in and of itself is not a bad thing. But it is when we misplace our love in that, when we misplace our mission in just the action rather than the people that we're reaching out to. The second thing is on a train of thought somewhere that I'm forgetting in this moment. Rats. What was Ooh, that? Don't say that word. Rat? Oh, sorry. Ugh. Um, squirrels. Um, That's better. It's a little better. I like squirrels. That's a lot better, actually. Speaking of squirrels. I just got to write <laughs> something down. Second I didn't bring a pen. <laughs> second thought. I like that word. First was misplaced love. Misplaced mission. There it is. Train of thought has re-entered the station. So the second thing is, how are we intentionally putting ourselves in situations with non-believers? Here at Christ Wesleyan, it is very easy to live a life that is completely insulated. Oh, definitely as a pastor. Oh, yeah. Especially as us. We have a lot of people who we're caring for. Yes. You know, so a lot of times, you know, calling those who are sick, you know, that are within our congregation and, you know, the visits are mostly to our congregation and the support and help are mostly to our congregation, which is okay. I believe the Acts 242 model does base it on that because people see, man, I want to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. And so there is that, but then we have to be extra intentional to go outside and say, I need to chill with unbelievers or how, how are they going to hear if I don't go exactly. to them? Yeah. Are we putting ourselves in those positions where we're regularly interacting with those who don't believe in Christ? Because it can be very easy to become our own bubble. I mean, we both went to IWU. The phrase, the IWU bubble was a very real thing where we as students 
could stay in the midst of the college and get everything that we needed with other Christians around us. Granted, not everybody at Iowa were Christians, but that was the general culture of it. So we had to be really intentional about taking steps to not be in that bubble, to not be in the midst of that. And like you said, there's nothing wrong with Christian community in and of itself. But once again, that can become a misplaced love where you are no longer interacting with those who need to hear the message of Christ, who need to hear the gospel. And there has to be a balance there. Yeah, there has to be a balance. For those who haven't, I don't want to always assume that everybody who is here or listening knows Christianese because that can be a little bit foreign. So when I say Acts 2.42, I'm hoping not everybody knows what that is. So if you're listening or if you're in the room, let me read Acts 2.42 for you. This is, this is after the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. Acts 2.42 says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer, they meaning Christians and believers. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, verse 46, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Every day they did this. Not every week, every day. You want to go to church every day? Right. They broke bread in their homes. This is apart from meeting in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So there has to be an essence of this community of believers taking care of each other. And then God added to their number daily those who were being saved because of how they were treating each other. You look at a lot of what Paul wrote to these churches, and it was mostly to Christians. It wasn't to the outside world. It was to Christians. of, Hey, quit treating each other like crap because you're doing damage to the gospel. That's the essence of the epistles or the letters written to these churches. So I just wanted to give context. I didn't when I say Acts 2.42, some of you might not know what I'm talking about, but there's the context. Mm -hmm. One of the metaphors that often comes to mind when people describe a church is that the church is a hospital where the sick come and then they leave. Personally, I don't really like that metaphor because nobody wants to be in a hospital. Nobody wants to come to there. They only come when they need it and they leave. Rather, in my opinion, this is... A little bit more, not that there's anything bad about hospitals. Hospitals are a place to go. <laughs> we love hospitals. To die. Anybody, <laughs> office fans out there, I know it's a, maybe. But anyways, I see the church as more of a harbor where we are, we are planted in a place with a lighthouse to be able to help guide people, not only who belong to our harbor, but ships who are lost to come in. But you don't always stay at a harbor you can be sent out as well. And then there's always this home base that you have to refresh, to come and get to be home for a little while, but there's always that sending notion out to it. Granted, there are probably more metaphors that can better enhance the church and seeing it that way, but there is a sense in which we are here to minister to the sick. We are here to minister to the lost, but... They're not meant to completely leave the church after that, but rather it is to invest into the community of believers so that we can be equipped to go out and therefore bring non-believers in as well to become a part of that faith. And yeah, it's Luke chapter 5, verse 31. Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Yeah, and that's definitely something that fits along that hospital metaphor. So Yeah, I mean, I could probably do a whole sermon right now on this text of how many churches get that wrong. And I don't, I'm not going to, because that might be something down the road, but that, that scripture for me is very, very powerful when it comes to the focus that the church needs to have. The organizational church, but also the church, you and I, need to know that, which is why you said you need to, we need to focus in and make sure we have people in our lives who need Jesus. So I, I, I was going to, and I forget the quote now, but I was going to put it in my outline, 
And I didn't because I'm like, oh, I'm just going to say it because it was really cool. And I wanted you all to write it down, but I totally forgot to say it. <laughs> and I can't think of it right now for some reason. Maybe I will by the end. But anyways, does anybody else have any other questions that they want to ask? Clarity? It's one or the other. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get to you. Okay, so as a follow-up to the whole, do you want to know when you die? I, I don't want to know when I die, but I'd like to know how I die. That's interesting, Craig, because that is very different. I know. It's, it's different, but it's kind of the same, too, because if, Craig, let, let's say, you know, I know you wrecked your motorcycle, but before that, if God would have said, Craig, you're going to die by a motorcycle accident. Would you ever get on a bike again? Yeah. You would, really, <laughs> really, knowing that's how you're going to die. Listen, it's this like, is, I tell people all the time, I, I, I hope I go out serving the Lord. Like, it'd, yeah. be, it'd be so cool to be get hit by a bus. And Craig, I know India. you probably will, to be honest. You probably will. I, I want to go out, like, I'm sliding in sideways. I'm not saying you're going to get hit by a bus. I'm just saying, you're going to die serving the Lord somehow. I don't, sliding I don't. in sideways with a trail of sparks and my hair on fire. That's what I tell people. <laughs> An interesting question was, if you could choose how you died, how would you choose? But you're right, the how versus the when is a little bit different. So if we were to ask the audience here, how many of you would want to know how you died? Yeah, a few more hands. I think it would be pretty interesting. You know, I, I think it would be interesting. I would be more apt to raise my hand there than when. Okay, so my question. <laughs> but it's like, oh, you're going to die in your sleep. Oh, I'm never sleeping again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so you, you quoted uh, this quote, without focus, you won't be as effective in your work because if you're not concentrating on the right things or are distracted, you won't be capable of getting your work done. So what is our mission? What, if you had to sum up what the mission of the church is in a couple of sentences, what is the mission of the church. I think it's bring, bringing lost people to Jesus, showing them that there's a better way. Okay, so like, I guess I, I, I'm so stuck on Matthew 28, go make disciples, teaching them to obey, baptizing yeah. them, teaching yeah. them to obey, and I'm with you to the end of the age. Like, I, yeah. I personally think that that is our mission, right? That is, he summed it all up, and, and that's... That was certainly the mission that he gave those disciples who were there with him. You think it's not? Absolutely. I do. But he said specific places, too, to them that resonated with them. And then he did to the ends of the earth. You know, Jesus knew that they weren't going to go to the ends of the earth because they didn't have transportation. They didn't have Internet to do that. I do believe making disciples is what we need to be doing. Absolutely. We need to be baptizing, sure. So part of the reason why I went from my whole pre-trib rapture thing is because Jesus specifically said the gospel is going to go to every nation and then the end will come. And right now we have somewhere between 6,500 and 7,000 unreached people groups, a couple billion people in this world who have not heard the gospel, who have no chance of hearing the gospel and we don't we're not intentional we're not focused on going to those people how are we not when you say we first of all who do you mean we we as in the church at large uh, okay. so statistics one in eighteen hundred people one in eighteen hundred christians go to the mission field um another one we send 30 times as many missionaries who do go to the mission field to somebody else's Jerusalem or Judea instead of the ends of the earth where they haven't had the gospel. Um, we send 99% of our money to the places where the gospel's already at, and we all but ignore the places where the gospel's not at. Like, I feel like we've lost that ends of the earth focus. Do you, do you agree, disagree? I don't know if I agree or disagree. And that probably doesn't make sense to you. What we, I can only answer for what we do at Christ Wesleyan here, where we, we actually support missionaries. So 
missionaries actually need support in what they're doing. And so we as a church, we have that support because of the giving of our congregation. And so we've chosen, because not all churches do this, we've chosen to give 10% of what we get in tithe away. Not a, hardly, I don't know any churches who do that. So there's 10% of what we get that we don't touch other than supporting organizations that go, supporting missionaries that go, that might not be able to go, but we're supporting them, so we're going. So there might not be a direct, but there actually is, Craig, a direct you know, tie to our missions. And when, when Chad Heisey took over as global missions director, he and I met, and there's one thing that we said we need to get better at, is we need to get better at knowing which regions of, let's just say, Guatemala are unreached. And so we actually have a trip planned, but I don't know when yet, just because of the whole COVID crisis, we just don't know where we can go, when we can go legally. And so we said we want to do a vision trip where we want to find those places, not around the lake, but further out that have been unreached or need more help than you've been to San Juan and San Pedro. And while it's a lot different than here, we've kind of tapped all the resources there in that area. So I asked Chad, where can we go other than there? Where people, where we haven't been yet and where a lot of people won't go? Because then we'll find what you say, those unreached people groups. And so there is something in motion where we can do that. We can do that because of the mission giving. And so there's people that are going to be called to future missions trips where we are going to go and try to reach people we've never reached before in those areas. Does that make sense? Because I'm, I'm right on par. I'm right on target with you, Craig. But while I am called to missions, I believe in the way that I do missions of being in Guatemala and going to Africa a couple times, I believe there are moments where I, I need to go and that I will go. But there's also people who aren't called to necessarily go because they might do more harm than good, honestly, because of whatever personality they have where they're meant to be here. They're meant to just go 20 minutes to Williamsport and you're going to have people who haven't heard Jesus like that. And I'm amazed here in our area when you preach Jesus the way that the Bible preaches Jesus and they're like, I don't know that, Jesus. I've never heard it like that. And so there's actually unreached with the true gospel people around here, too. And so, like, you and me, Craig, might be more called to do mission work overseas and whatever. There might be people who are called to stay here, too. So I believe when you look at our mission budget, what, what we focus on in our missions, what we give away, we give away over $400,000 away. And, but that includes support to help people to go, you know, so it's, it's different, but it's still accomplishing the mission as well that you would say. As a, as a follow up to that whole conversation about golf, like I think you could use golf as long as you're intentional about sharing the gospel, about discipleship, like you go and, and you disciple somebody on the golf carts. You can do that. Sure. I absolutely believe not everybody can go to the mission field. I guess my, my struggle is that we don't cons enough, concentrate enough on the ends of the earth. Like every, Even if you don't go, you can definitely be in prayer for unreached people groups, Agreed. for missionaries there. You can be intentional about encouraging people to go to mission. There is always something more that we could do, Craig. I, I completely believe that. Have you given any thought to Mission Sundays coming back at any time? And yep. Okay. I have. Right. But else, I will say this. So this year, Craig, is there's just a ton of transitions. And I'm actually thinking of doing a standalone message here in January sometime when I'm preaching just to say, all right, it's been here you've been seeing a couple things happen and here's why you've been seeing this here's why you've been seeing that updating on certain things but 
a mission moment in service is actually something that I do want to bring back. It's just right now there's just bigger transitional things that I want to get through. But I think you'll be you'll be seeing, you know, missions because Pastor Arley was very highly focused on missions. And I love mission moments. You know, the mission that we have in Sunbury through the Recovery Church is just so incredible. But not a lot of people at Christ Wesleyan know about those stories. So I want to bring those stories in a way that we can all know, you know, here's what, what we're helping to support here. Here's why we do it. So, yes, that's a long answer, but yes, Craig. Yeah, when you were reading the scripture about um, how the early church lived every day in the temple, eating together in people's homes, weren't they, how did they attract people? Like, how did they go out? How did they have time? So they didn't (laughs) spend all day with each other. They still had their day jobs. They still had their other things that they did. But also, you remember, the, the towns are a lot smaller. The emphasis wasn't so much on staying in, but out in a community. The temple was a lot of times the center of the community, and the temple wasn't necessarily inside. It was the temple courts. But how they would see this is when, when you see verses where they would sell their property, people would know. Wait, what? And people would know, like, wait, didn't you owe that? Oh, you don't anymore? Wasn't your land going to be, t- oh, it doesn't, how? You know, and they can say, well, I'm, I'm part of this. Things were a little bit less private back then because everything was closer together there was more of a community feel in in all and so when they would be doing these things it wouldn't the the privacy wouldn't be there obviously they had to be private because at this time christianity was not legal so when they met in the homes that was when they would you know talk about jesus and where had they had everything in common and actually at this time the temple was not a christian temple it was Judaism then, but still in this day, they still, some of them went to the temple still to pay homage to their heritage. You know, Christian churches weren't a thing until Constantine made it legal, which was a couple hundred years after our text here. And so what they, they had to do it in homes where they ate together. But all that other things that they did with their property and they sold it, and that means other people would get things, people would notice that just because of the close-knit aspect of that culture. When I, I said that to Marv, and then he had a point also. Um, yeah, we hear a lot about the church in Acts and how, how and it, obviously it was great. Um, but a little later on in Acts, God allowed or sent persecution and kind of blew that whole thing up. Um, So maybe they were too comfortable and a little sobering. Maybe we're too comfortable sometimes too. Hopefully it doesn't take persecution to blow us up. It might. Right, because Acts 6 talks about, you know, starts the stoning of Stephen. It's actually chapter 7 is when, when Stephen is stoned. And that was, Stephen is known as one of the first Christian martyrs and it's interesting because the apostle paul is the one who okayed his death and look what happened to the apostle paul so i i have been known to say and i will i will say christianity actually thrives more in persecution than it does in privilege and that's hard to hear because we cling so much to our religious freedoms and that's one of the greatest things about america is that when America was started, it was from the bondage of a monarchy saying you have to have this religion, you have to have this religion. And so now they say, no, this is the freedom of religion. This is America. We are free. It's one of the greatest things about our country is our freedom. And one of those things is religious freedom. And a lot of Christians get all bent out of shape when they think, oh, no, our religious freedoms are going to be taken away. And while, yes, that stinks, you know, because that's what people have fought for, for this country. That's what they risk coming to this country, is this religious freedom. But you look at other er- as- other areas of the world where Christianity, where religious freedom isn't a thing. 
Actually, in most of the world, religious freedom isn't a thing. But you look at the, Christ, the Christian numbers in Christianity in those nations, and they actually put us to shame in who is coming to Christ and how many people are coming to Christ. So was it great when Constantine made it legal? It's nice. We can do things like this and not be afraid of people walking in and shooting us because that's certainly not a lot of the world. And so, yeah, it's great. It's awesome. But it also can cause apathetic living, this comfortable living where we aren't stretched. And faith is the best when it's stretched. Even though it's horrible, it's painful, it's awful, it actually thrives in that way. So it, there, there is something to that. And, you know, I don't, don't want to offend people by taking advantage of the freedoms that, you know, they fought for and people have died for because it's great. But that's why we all we need to be more intentional of how, all right, let's take advantage that Christianity right now is legal here. But a lot of times we don't take advantage of it. We actually sit back and enjoy the advantage rather than taking advantage. So you have a really good point. And I hope it doesn't come to persecution, but you're looking at the way things are going. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if, if American Christianity is, isn't persecuted in my lifetime, especially in my daughter's lifetime. I just kind of have an observation more than a question. Um, when I got out of the military and came back to the area, I looked for a church for many years. And everyone that I went to, what I found was people went to church, they sang some hymns, they listened to the pastor talk, and they went home. And you didn't hear anything from them the rest of the week. You wouldn't have known that they even went to church unless you saw them in there on Sunday, um, and this is kind of ties in with the golf as well. I, I lived behind Wayne Batchelder f for a couple years, and we would talk at the fence many times, and he rode a Harley, had a hot rod. I never had any idea that he was a pastor, going to be a pastor, until he found out that I was looking for a home church, and told me about Christ Wesley, and, and, and I, was I, I was hesitant because of the amount of people that, that come here. I was looking for a small church, something personal, and he talked me in, into coming out here, and when I did, I immediately, when you walk in the door here, it's not like any other church that I've ever been to. You can almost feel um, the love and, and for Christ in, in this building. And, and you come out here on a Wednesday night and pull into the parking lot, and there's the parking lot's full. And you, you just don't see that in, in, in other churches. And so when you look at me, not many people think, well, there's a Christian walking down the street with my tattoos and such. So I have an opportunity to talk to people that probably wouldn't talk about religion. I long-range hunt, so I get somebody out on a mountain somewhere. They're not going anywhere, and now we're going to talk. Um, and you have a gun. <laughs> and I have a gun. Yeah, probably two. Yeah. You know, I ride bicycle, and although I talk to so we do group rides, and I talk to some guys. Some guys know that I come to church. Um, but when we started the 40 days of fasting, we do a ride on Wednesdays where we ride out to the Amish donut shop in Turbotville, and we get donuts, and we do a 35-mile loop, so we work them off. However, <laughs> everybody knows I like donuts and how much I like them. But that's we, why you bike, right? Right. But when we started the fast, and I went out the first Wednesday, I didn't have a donut, and nobody believed why I wouldn't eat a donut because I was fasting. And so I got a whole new group of people, and I got some of those guys to come in here, and one of them has been coming back every since with me. So I guess my point is with the golf, it, it does give you an opportunity to talk to a group of people that maybe would never have the opportunity to talk about it. Because there are people that are interested, but have had experiences like me with churches that just feel cold. And, and when you get them here, 
just like they did me, then you're, you know. Right, and like when you read Matthew 28, it's more than evangelism, it's discipleship. Disciple is an intentional word, because when we think about it, we think of the 12 disciples that Jesus spent time with. You know, Jesus spent most of his time, not on the fringes, with his disciples, teaching them, knowing he was in the fringes a little bit. He was with the marginalized too, but he wanted to focus in on the 12 to disciple them so that they could then do the same. And so it is about evangelism, but it's also more about that. It's bringing people into discipleship so that they can experience a freedom because, you know, we hear a lot of times when, when we go over seas and we evangelize and we say the prayer of salvation and they raise their hands and say, yeah, I said it. And so we give them a gift a lot of times. And so they're like, well, how do you know they're truly saved? And one, that's not our business of what went on in their heart between them and God. But two, we get every single name. We do not count a salvation unless we have their name. Because then in the villages where they're being saved, we tell, we give their names to all the local pastors because the local pastors are going to know these new converts and will know how to disciple them when we leave. And so that's a misconception. I think a lot of people, well, of course, you know, they had kids or whatever, but we know them by name and they're counted by name. And then hopefully those pastors follow through with them to disciple them further. So there is evangelism, but man, there also needs to be focus on discipleship. And that's where we come in, in our communities where we can disciple people. We can golf with them, which can be a form of discipleship. Biking is a form of discipleship where you're doing life together, where you're there. And when they have questions, you're there for them to help them go deeper. That's how we need to approach our local living. But if God is going to call us outside of this local area, we need to then say, okay, I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to miss a few weeks of golf to go, you know, to the ends of the earth. We need to learn how to be obedient. But is one right and one wrong? No. There could be seasons of one. There could be seasons of another. So you're absolutely right. And just imagine if all believers approached it like you do. You know, even within the context of Christ Wesleyan, if everybody approached their, their daily living and the community living like you do as an opportunity to bring in disciples, to live life with them like Jesus did with his disciples and what he called his disciples to do with their disciples. And so it's interesting, and I want to correct something I said on Sunday because looking back at it, I just, I got it mixed up. But Matthew and John are actually the only the Gospels that were direct eye, eyewitnesses of, of Jesus, the disciples. Luke, Matthew, or Mark and Luke were actually not disciples of Jesus. Mark was a disciple of Peter, and then Paul discipled Luke. So when you're reading Luke, that's actually Paul's disciple. And then Mark is Peter's disciple. So when you read Mark, it's actually Peter's Gospel told to his disciple, Mark. I think I got those two switched, so I just need to correct that for you. I don't know if we have it. It's 746. Holy cow. Yeah. That went fast. That did go by really fast. Well, that is all the time that we have in regards to the official time. Feel free to stay afterwards. Talk with the people that are around you. Talk with us. We love hanging out with you all. Thank you so much for choosing to spend some time with us here today at Dive Deep Live. The heart of why we do this is to bring about transformation for Christians in our community and across the globe in any walk of life to look and be more like Jesus. Spread the word about this podcast and this night so that way more people can benefit from it. We're here in the Davis Chapel from 6.45 to 7.45 p.m. if you're local to Milton, or where you can also find us on cwc.life slash dive dash deep. That's CWC Dive Deep on Apple Podcasts and on YouTube at our Christ Wesleyan Church channel. There's plenty of content to go see at all of those sources. 
including the pieing of the pastors on YouTube, which Chloe and I watched the other day. It is hilarious mm. to watch that over again. Yeah, because we both missed out. Yeah. yeah, that's probably why it's funny to me. But next year, it probably won't be as funny if I end up getting the pie. But we'll see. The look on Pastor Ken's face when he got at second service. Yeah, because he wasn't supposed to. Beautiful. Arlie missed. It was great. Right. I highly recommend you watch it if you didn't. And, and if, Ryan's if, reaction was just if you like, notice, If you notice first service, how Pastor Arlie, who, who is in first service, you see it. You notice how Pastor Arlie kind of just crushed Pastor Ryan. And it went all over. The reason he did it harder there is because Ryan made a comment just before that said, aren't you retired? And so he got it even harder. That's why it went all the way back to the drums. But anyways. Well, thanks again, everyone, for joining us here. And we hope you've enjoyed this night and this podcast. And I pray that this gathering has made you more aware of God's plan and his presence in your life. Go in the grace of God.